Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. U.S. adults spent three hours and 48 minutes a day on computers, tablets, and smartphones in the first quarter of last year. This is a 13-minute increase from the previous quarter, and 62% of that time is attributed to app-slash-web browsing on smartphones. On smartphones. Television still accounts for most media usage, with four hours and 46 minutes spent watching TV every day. You can thank baby boomers for that one. So we're going to look at a couple things today. Millennials are the therapy generation, according to a review piece in the Wall Street Journal. And do not disturb how I ditched my phone and unbroke my brain. I love it. From the New York Times, uh, from a tech columnist there. So we're going to look at these two articles and what they tell us about America's current screen time and uh, and our current relationship with technology. And of course, millennials just seem to fit in that. So we threw in, you know, Lance's uh, therapy article as well. So why do you care though, Lance? I mean, who, who gives a darn about any of this? I don't know, because I'm going to watch whatever I want to. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. So don't be cracking on my generation uh, well, watching yeah, TV. Yeah, well, see, but you get, you guys crack on us for, oh, you can't get your face out of those phones. Well, you guys can't get your face away from the boob tube. I don't watch TV. Well, it's just on. May, oh, it's just noise. <laughs> is that one. It is. Yeah, the house is quiet. Uh huh. But usually when I'm reading, you could you could have a radio going. The sound's down. No, I don't have any sound. I can't read with with sound. So you have the TV on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because every once in a while I'll look up from reading my book or my magazine uh-huh. and like I'll have it on the CNBC uh-huh. and see how, you know, the S&P is doing. And okay. So you'll have it on. So if it's not on CNBC, what's it on? MSNBC or CNN? Um, Usually. I MSNBC. Mean, and then you okay. can read. The scroll. The scrolls. The thing. Right. Or ESPN. Okay. And then I can read, you know, what the football scores mm-hmm. were, what the, the baseball – Preseason stay up was, to date. who's trading right. Uh-huh. So there's no noise, but it's, it's more reading. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if that counts as watching TV. I mean, it's using a screen. It's using a screen. Yeah. I Well, I don't know. We had, you know, CNN was like, it used to be the de facto, right? That was kind of the middle of the road option. Right. But I'm not sure if that's so true anymore. So... Millennials are the therapy generation. The Wall Street Journal. Quote, I figured I would use therapy to get through my trauma, and then be done, said a millennial. I eventually learned that's not really how it works. She has had four or five different therapists since then. So have most of her friends. The stigma traditionally attached to psychotherapy has largely dissolved in the new generation of patients seeking treatment, raised by parents who openly went to therapy themselves and who sent their children as well, today's 20 and 30-somethings, turned to therapy sooner and with fewer reservations than young people did in previous years. A 2018 report from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association found a 47% increase between 2013 and 2016 in depression diagnoses among 18 to 34-year-olds. Dr. Cohen, the Manhattan psychologist, says she recalls one recent 20-something client who was unsure about whether to stay in a relationship. Quote, it really felt like she had gone from therapist to therapist looking for one that would tell her what to do, end quote, she says. I think therapists' natural instinct is to listen and not give advice can be challenging and threatening to some millennials. Technology has contributed to the expectation of a quick fix. Oh, what? Huh? <laughs> what was that? What was that one? Apps, technology technology mm-hmm. has contributed okay. to the expectation yep. of a quick fix. Gotcha. Apps and online services such as Talkspace and mm-hmm. My Therapist offer therapy by phone, chat, video, and message board, making it more likely that young people will opt for superficial over meaningful long-term help. Christina and her partner started couples counseling in 2017 when they got their first apartment together. Quote, if my mom and stepdad weren't communicating well, they'd be like, oh, let's just talk about it over dinner, she says. But we work late and then it 
home, we're answering emails on our phones and talking it talking it out over dinner just doesn't work that way anymore. Because you didn't put down your phone. A 2018 study of 40,000 Americans, Canadian, and British college students published in the Journal of Psychological Bulletin found that millennials are suffering from, quote, multidimensional perfectionism, end quote, in many areas of their lives, setting unrealistically high expectations and feeling hurt when they fall short. Some millennials also use life coaches. That includes a 29-year-old freelance journalist in Whitefish, Montana. My life coach and my therapy work really well together, she says. It's about forming habits and behaviors that lead to a fuller life. You think? Okay. So, Lance. Yes. Net positive or net negative, the millennials <clears throat> are seeking. Are you done reading? Are seeking. Well, for oh, now. Oh, good. Okay. All right. <laughs> There's more to come later. All right. You were getting bored? I was. Oh, yeah. sorry to hear that. You kind of lost me there. Okay. Well, you've read this now at least twice. It, I did. And yes. then three times, if you count listening to me, mm-hmm. read part Which of it I again. I listened. Yeah, I did. Okay. So what's your question? So the question is, net positive or net negative that millennials are more willing to go to therapy and seek it out than previous generations? Well, no, in all honesty, it's a positive. You know, I think it's, I grew up in a time when I remember um, 1972, Thomas Eagleton uh, was nominated for the vice Democratic vice presidential seat, and it came out that he had seen he had had sought out psychological help, and he had to withdraw himself from the vice presidential nomination process uh, because people were like, well, "We can't have somebody like that being." you know, one heartbeat away from the president. Uh-huh. And um, so I think, it, but, and, and because I truly believe that it's a good thing, you know, that people, um, if they need to talk to someone or talking to someone makes their life better, then we should support it and we should believe in it. And it should um, not be something where we ostracize someone or think less of them. You know, I had it explained to me one time, I always felt this way, but I read it one time when we were talking about it, I think it was in a college class, um, that they said, well, it's called mental illness and physical illness. So why wouldn't you seek treatment for it and why is it not okay? You know, if you go to the doctor because you have a bad cough or because you don't feel well and they give you medicine and you take it, or I says, oh, glad you're feeling better. So why should there be a stigma attached to something that we refer to as mental illness? Um, that is, you know, if something's not firing right or you're not thinking correctly or you need help in your thinking process and you go and you get that help or you have anxiety or whatever and you take um, a little bit of medicine and it helps you deal with things and you're a better person because of it, why should there be a stigma attached to that? Why should you be seen as weak? And I'm like, well, Dag, that makes sense to me. So uh, obviously a positive, you know, um, I think – A lot of times, though, and I guess I don't know, but like the article stated, sometimes people go to therapy, though, well, tell me what I should do. And what I, having never been um, in therapy myself, having talked to people who are, it, it, though, is, and basically, and I think I've been therapeutic within my teaching and coaching career, talking kids through issues that you never tell them what to do. You have them verbalize what their choices are and what's going on and have them come to some conclusion as to what's best. And and I did that raising my own ki- my own children. You know, I don't once they reach the, you know, teenage years, other than rules that we had at home, it's like, but now that they're adults, it's like, well, what do you think? What's your pro and con list? What do you, you know, which which one do you think? And da, da. You know, I think we all want somebody to tell us what to do because then if it doesn't work, well, it's their fault. And that's not how you grow. You grow as an individual and you mature as an individual making your own decisions. And here we're back to failure again. Sometimes you learn from your mistakes. It's like, hmm, last time I thought this and that didn't work. So now I'm going to try this. Well, this works. So, you know, next time I'm going to choose this first and see if that continues, if everything lines up the same. So, yeah, bottom line, net positive. Okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know. I mean, you looked at this as a career. 
I did. Right. I yes. Mean. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> it would be it would be rather hypocritical. Right. Well, but in fairness too, I also chose not to. That's what I thought I was going to do, and then I said no, at least not right now. Um, and part of I guess what I I had probably known this, but I hadn't consciously really acknowledged it until you had pulled this article is just thinking about the number of people who I was in school with who I knew had gone to mm. some kind of therapy while they were in high school right. or college or college. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and so, and not really giving much thought to it, you know, beyond, because there was such a wide spectrum of issues that they were dealing with from what I think. And again, this isn't to minimize certain issues because obviously for different people, things carry a different weight. Uh, so it, it's certainly subjective to say that some issues are milder than others, but from, from a, you know, thousand, 10,000 foot viewpoint, mm -hmm. we could probably say that people struggling, you know, with time management, uh, for homework, likely are not quite on the same magnitude as those who are struggling with severe depression and possibly suicidal thoughts. Right. I mean, you know, just relatively speaking, uh, without taking into account their situations. But so there was such a wide range because I knew both ends of the spectrum. The just the people who kind of like you had said, they're just kind of looking for somebody to give them some guidance. Uh, they're not, it's not so much they feel like they have this problem that they need to fix. It's more that they're facing something and they don't maybe know how to navigate it. And they just want what they're looking for is an answer. Mm -hmm. And I think the misconception that some have is that therapy gives you an answer when really, as you mentioned, the goal is to help you discover the answer. Uh, if it's, if it's, you know, therapy, if it's good therapy, right? Uh, I, because yeah, right. you don't want to be, you don't, if your therapist is telling you that this is the answer, uh, you maybe should find a different one. And it's really hard. I, uh, for a short time, I volunteered um, for an online <clears throat> counseling position. Mm. I had to go through training and learning about active listening. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, And it's a real challenge. You really have to think about, you know, we don't, I don't think we give it much thought, but the people in those positions trying to respond and continue the conversation without seeming like they're trying to lead you towards something. Like you smacking know? them upside the head and saying, hey, come on, stupid. Don't you see what the <laughs> yes. what obvious answer is here? Uh -huh. right. No, yep. it is. It is is very much a skill. And, you know, I guess I need to just to be totally honest, I think we all, whether we've been to someone, quote, professionally for therapy, we all have go through therapy. Right. I mean, doing, we all have people doing this show three days a week is therapeutic for me. Mm -hmm. And it helps me get through and voice some of my concerns or frustrations, or I feel better when I leave because I've been around some people that, that give off positive vibes. You know, that's therapy. That's therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Um, going home and talking with my spouse, you know, and talking over, well, should we go here? Should we spend money on this? Should we buy this? Should, should we, help our daughters do this, you know, that's therapy because you're talking to someone. And like you said, you're talking to someone who is helping guide you to an answer. Right. You know, and then obviously you have to be careful when you, when you do that with people who aren't professional, because they can, like you said, guide you to the answer that they want you to make. Right. But we all get therapy mm -hmm. in our day. I mean, and if we don't get it from other sources, then we have to maybe seek it out. Or like you said, our problems are so deep that nobody else and nothing else helps us. And so we have to seek professional help or we have some kind of chemical or n neurons aren't firing or something. And so we have to see somebody who can prescribe us medicine to help us with these things. So like you said, there's different levels, but I just want to make sure I, I do understand and want anybody, you know, all of a sudden getting on their accounts and coming in and saying, well, yeah, but if you talk to your wife, that's therapy. Exactly. And I, I totally agree with that, you know, and then I was, th as you were talking, I was thinking about that, you know, and coming, yeah. like I said, coming here and doing the show. So we all seek therapy. Some of us need a different kind of therapy than you can get just 
right. living your life. Well, informal versus I think what you're getting at, informal, which for most of us, most of the time, the informal stuff is all we need. Fulfills what we need. Right. right. But I've speaking from personal experience, I also know that it can be when you care about somebody, it can be really easy to think that you have that you can handle giving them you know, the advice or therapy they need. Oh, not true. And that is so not true. Uh, well, ex- yeah. And uh, it's almost the opposite, truly. Yes. Usually the closer you are to someone, uh, the the less <laughs> qualified you are to provide them with that type of... The more emotionally you are attached to that person, yeah. the much less likely you are going to be able to be an advisor. Right. Or, or a, <laughs> an objective advisor, yes. right? Cause yes. I mean, you have a stake yes. and when you care about somebody that much, um, I can be your mom or your dad or your spouse right. or your significant other, uh-huh. but I can't be your counselor. Right. I, I, Cause they don't necessarily mm-hmm. mix. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, and it's not to say mm-hmm. that for smaller things, it's not, but like, I guess what I'm getting at is for people who are facing those really much more severe challenges, like, you know, uh, severe depression, suicidal thoughts, those types of things. It isn't that your family or friends can't be helpful because they can, but it's, they can be helpful in a more supportive way, uh, where you certainly shouldn't, uh, think that that is your only line of defense. Cause there is a reason that there's people who train for this kind of thing. And it's not to say they're always successful because obviously they're not. Um, but having, just an objective outside opinion is is always it doesn't hurt. Put it that way. Well, if you have it's, a real personal relationship with the person, the words you say may be taken differently than the word of a therapist. The, the therapist may say the exact same thing. Yep. But because there's not that personal connection, and I mean, you know what I mean by personal. That there's yeah. a you know parental label or or you know other them. label. Um, the words mean different things. Yep. You know, I just like, you talk to children all the time and being a teacher and they'll say, well, my parents said, well, do your best. And I feel pressure that I have to get all A's and B's because no, 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 they really don't. Well, your parents, they maybe the parents didn't mean that at <laughs> right, all, right. but that's the way the child took those words uh-huh. and internalized them. And even as a parent, it's tough to then explain to them that, no, that's not what I mean. You know, right. if, if a C is the best you can do or 40% on this test is the best you can do, then bravo. I'm, I'm in your corner. Yeah. You know, I just mean do your best. But so many times we say things to people, even as adults to adults, that we mean one thing and they hear something else right. or internalize something else. They load it with their experiences of that right. person. Right. Um, because that's, I mean, that's how we're wired. So that's why that outside opinion. Again, not always a professional opinion, but that outside opinion can be very valuable. Yes, I um, totally agree. Because if the the further removed they are from the situation emotionally, the easier it is for you to not take what they're saying in a different way than they mean it, you know? So, Good point. Yes. On that note, Lance, we're going to look at how I ditched my phone and unbroke my brain. And not me personally, but uh, Kevin Rose, who writes for the New York Times mm-hmm. and writes about tech nonetheless. Uh, so I, it caught my attention and I think it's interesting. But before we get to that, why are we talking about millennials, the therapy generation and unbreaking your brain and well, because, all this stuff? Because we have a mission here at True Chat. Believe it or not, we have a mission. We have, we have a statement okay. that goes along with it. Okay. So we have a mission statement. Yeah, but we have a mission. Okay. We have an objective that we're trying okay. to obtain. That we're working. And we went so far as to actually write down words to oh. explain what that mission is. And there's a poster on and the wall. And sometimes it's known as the mission statement <laughs> okay. at this point in the show. That's and true. I it, usually, just, it actually just says our mission, see, though, right? I am, it I doesn't am say it. statement. I'm just letting you know, just making it, <laughs> throwing it out there. But our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. Excellent. And it's my mission on most shows. To share that with the audience. That's what we're trying to do. That's another reason that I'm on the show. <laughs> is is somebody <laughs> has to share the mission so that people know what we're trying to achieve uh, by doing this little podcast that we do three days a week. Gotcha. So, and I think, right, uh, people, if they have concerns, it's their job to keep us accountable. So they email ethics at truechat.org and they tell us 
how Lance is failing. Yep. Uh, and then we look into it. That's, yep. that's how usually, that goes. Usually they tell us how great I am. Oh. And if I ever had a good, you know, if I ever had a good host that I, I could, <laughs> the stars are the limit for me. But okay. I, but I'm, I'm here trying to prop <laughs> you up. You're, you're handcuffed. By yeah. The, well, you know, <laughs> the limited talent. We all available. have crosses in life. That's right. Know, we have to bear. We, we, we <laughs> all have those burdens, those things that are keeping us down. Uh, the man is keeping me down. That's, uh, always has been your whole life, yeah, too. All, right? all I up. Every every shortcoming has been the man. Okay. Yeah. Has it ever been a woman? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just meant man uh, as I the know. human race. I know what you meant. Mankind. Yeah. I just had that Lance pun opportunity. <laughs> you did I, see. I, I had to take I'm wearing it. off on you after <laughs> six years or however long this has been. Seven. Seven Over years. Seven. Yeah, we're going wow. on. This just like a good marriage, you lose track of time. <laughs> oh, I don't know how long it's been. Been married five good years. You've been married seven. Uh, yep, uh, five of them been good. <laughs> We've had five good right. years on this show. That's right. Uh, so, if you want to engage and let us know your thoughts, please at TrueChat org at TrueChat org Facebook Twitter. Lance has brought us some new listeners this year. He's been working on it, I right? I am, yeah. So special thanks to those uh, who have tuned in because they know Lance. We're we're so glad you're here. Maybe you can provide some unique input on social media. <laughs> so if he says anything that's- Like, don't listen to that dude. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if he says anything that you think's out of line, <clears throat> you know what to do. So this article uh, was actually a notification, ironically, on my phone, mm-hmm. um, and, it, and it, uh, it did catch my attention. So I, I mentioned before that Americans spend uh, quite a substantial amount of time every day in front of screens, uh, four plus hours for TV. Ugh. Just think about that. The average American, four plus hours of TV. Well, wait a minute. That's only 28 hours a week, right? Yeah. So and there's seven days in a week, right? Uh-huh. Times 24. So if I watch one baseball game a day, that's three hours. Yep. So I'm already at 21. <laughs> Uh-oh. And if I watch an hour of news, <laughs> yep. right, so that's seven. There's my 28. You made your quota. <laughs> there's my 28. Man, I got to quit watching Perry Mason and Gunsmoke. <laughs> you need to take a nap during the game. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think that counts then because you're not. Well, but my wife will tell you that I read during the game. Okay. So it's not, again, you know, right, it's a, I can listen to the game uh-huh. and then still read. So growing up, was it mostly watching or listening no, to I baseball? Listened. Radio? Listened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. That was what I wanted to do through high school. What? Radio? Yeah. Yeah. I really did. So well, this is probably like, I know. That's, living the dream. That's why Except this we is. don't talk about baseball. It really is. Yep. <laughs> now all I got to do is get a job at, you know, the local grocery store bagging groceries and life will be complete. That's right. That's the other thing I always wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the grocery store. Just you bag know? the groceries. Yeah, when I went with mom when I was little. And that's why I'm, I think I'm comfortable yeah. doing the shopping because I always went with mom and helped pick things up and put them in the cart. And when I was growing up, I always wanted to work as a bagger. I didn't, I didn't want to be a clerk. I didn't want to work right. in a deli. You I wanted, wanted to, to be bag a bag groceries. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. You know why I quit? So when I do that, I've been on radio. Mm-hmm. I taught school and I, I'm, you just got to bag groceries, bag groceries. And I, the I bucket list is mm-hmm. complete. That's right. <laughs> He's done everything. But anyway, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. Uh, um, well, I was just saying, it's funny because we mentioned bagging groceries and wh- you know, I didn't realize it until recently, but one of the reasons that I've quit going in the lines that are staffed is because I prefer to bag them myself. Not because, you know, not because I don't know. Not because you're a control freak. Well, yeah, no, that's the reason. (laughs) (laughs) Because, because I don't like watching, I don't want, you know, 20 bags when 10 bags would do. And, you know, frankly, it's just too much hassle to try to get them to do it the the air quotes here the right way you know so and i also prefer the paper bags over the plastic and uh because i can put more in those you don't bags. recycle i take see i take i take reusable you take bags the plas- oh you take uh, reusable. i take reusable mm. bags dude yep. I'm, well you know why i get the paper bags i'm ahead of california you know i was using <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you know in california what the what the law is well yeah they just we, we, didn't we talk about <clears throat> that I think, on a did show? we okay i know we read the article but i was out there I don't in know. December, uh-huh. and if if you don't have a bag and they have to provide you one, it's ten cents. Wow. They they charge you for using. So Lance is showing up with his reusable bags. <clears throat> mm-hmm. 
Yep. Yep. I went to the store one time. I was visiting. I didn't have a bag. So I piled six things in my arm. And the guy goes, it's only a dime. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> I'm not going to pay for the bags. <laughs> not paying for a bag. <laughs> well, but see, I get the paper bags because right? we mm-hmm. use them when we're cleaning the litter box. Mm-hmm. Because then I can just leave everything in the paper bag and put it right on the compost. Yep. See? Because if you, and, and obviously if you put it in the plastic bag, that doesn't work then. Grandma always <laughs> cooled her, um, she had a couple different kinds of cakes uh-huh. that she cooled on her paper bags. Oh. So I watched my grandma uh-huh. use paper bags. Yep. And when, when she, um, you know, when she passed away, we, we had like, there were like two drawers in her kitchen full of <laughs> paper, paper bags. store bags. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that she was <clears throat> using, you know, supposedly. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so what about this? Yes. I digress from my, I, I have more than 28 hours in front of a TV screen. So I'm, I'm the one bumping that average up. My name is Kevin, and I have a phone problem. I've been a heavy phone user for my entire adult life, but sometime last year, I crossed the invisible line into problem territory. My symptoms were all the typical ones. I found myself incapable of reading books, watching full-length movies, or having long, uninterrupted conversations. Social media made me angry and anxious, and even the digital spaces I once found soothing, like group text, podcasts, YouTube, were were not helping. I tried various tricks to curb my usage, like deleting Twitter every weekend, turning my screen grayscale, and installing app blockers, but I always relapsed. Eventually, I decided enough was enough, and I called a science journalist and the author of How to Break Up with Your Phone, a 30-day guide to eliminating bad phone habits, and I begged her for help. So, I confess that entering phone rehab feels cliched, like getting really into healing crystals. Thankfully, Catherine's plan is more practical. I'm a tech columnist, and while I don't begrudge anyone for trying more extreme forms of disconnection, my job prevents me from going cold turkey. When we started, I sent her my screen time statistics, which showed that I spent five hours and 37 minutes on my phone that day and picked it up 101 times, roughly twice as many as the average American. So, Lance, we can extrapolate from there, right? The average American, about two hours and 45 minutes a day on their phone. Okay. And approximately 50 pickups. Think about that. Pick up that phone 50 times. Two hours, 45 minutes, almost three hours a day looking at that phone. I'm proud to report, though, Lance. I've got – I'm showing you here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at this. So you picked up your phone on the, I know shoot. Uh, so on my home screen in this upper left hand corner, can you see what that says? Nope. I know it's too far away. We're reaching He's, one hour of today. One hour of today's screen time. One hour. One yep. Hour. So you must've gotten up late. <laughs> yeah, apparently, <laughs> but I can look at the, there's a chart now. See last seven days of screen oh, time. Uh huh. Okay. I unlock my phone an average of 49 times per day. You're, so your average is Joe. In, in fairness, though, my screen time is about one hour and 25 minutes a day. So, so, under, you don't, so when you open it, you don't look at it as long I'm as— I'm not spending as long. Right. Also, my statistics are a little skewed this week because uh, Brett and I took a long drive and I had navigation open on my phone. And that counted against me. Oh, so I don't okay. know if that really, you know, does that oh, really count? So you're saying you're not really on it that much. Right. Uh, I mean. Well, but that counts, see. I guess. Because I have, I'm going, yeah, right. some, I'm going somewhere today after the show. Uh-huh. And I have driving directions in my pocket. So I'm not going to have my phone open. Right. For screen time. A, because my phone doesn't do that. <laughs> but B, I was say, that's, a, that's a cop you out, you know, because you can, you can get on a map and, you know, get yeah. your directions and then write them down. Then you don't have to open up your phone. You never got like a Garmin or anything like that? No, External dude. GPS? No. no? Okay. Uh, people will know where I am. Uh, so if I was going to repair my brain, we're back here to the article. Caleb's got a Garmin, he says. 
Oh, he's got a Garmin? Yeah. Okay. I just remember their Christmas commercials. Oh, my, my brother-in-law lives with his Garmin at, in yeah? California. Yeah. Okay. There's one in every car. And when I go out there, he gives it to me because I don't know my way around. Doesn't he have a smartphone? Huh? Yeah, but he loves his Garmin. Okay. He got, he got in. I mean, he's, he's techno. My yeah. brother-in-law in California, he's, he's techno he's really guru guy. Oh, he really is. And, okay. But, but he's, he's hung on to the old school Garmin. He, he likes gotcha. that. Yeah. If I was going to repair my brain, I needed to practice doing nothing. You heard right. So during my morning walk to the office, I looked up at the buildings around me, spotting See, Caleb, architectural. Hold, 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 wait, wait, okay. wait. Caleb was worried about not getting his car and having to walk. This guy, I just want to point out, oh, this guy oh. walked to work. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's okay. He's an American who walks to work. <laughs> I did too when we were in Cincinnati. Yeah, Caleb was afraid of you know losing his car. But yeah. Anyway. Hey, cars are American, right? I looked up at the buildings around me, spotting architectural details I'd never noticed. On the subway, I kept my phone in my pocket and people watched, noticing the natalie dressed man in the yellow hat, that teens eating some food I've never heard of, <laughs> laughing, the kid with the Velcro shoes. I noticed it all. When a friend ran late for our lunch, I sat still and stared out the window instead of checking Twitter. He didn't know what kind of food the kid was eating, or you don't know what kind of food. The kid I don't was know. Eating. Oh. I I've I've literally never seen that before, but it's okay. I've been like forty years old my whole life, so <laughs> uh, for me that meant deleting Twitter, Facebook, and all other social media apps, along with new apps and games. I kept messaging services like WhatsApp and Signal, and non-distracting utilities like cooking and navigation apps. I pruned my home screen to just the essentials, calendar, email, and password manager. And I disabled push notifications. Those are the things, you know, when your phone beeps. Even Lance has push notifications. You know, when you get a text and it makes a noise. Yeah. That's a push notification. It is. I learned some. Yeah. Thank you. All right. That's a push notification. All right. Well, think about it, right? It's push. It's notifying you. It's pushing a notification mm, to you. Got you. Using noise. And I disabled push notifications for everything other than phone calls and messages from a preset list of people that included my editor, my wife, and a handful of close friends. Where you keep you, where you keep your phone is also important, Lance. Studies have shown that people who don't charge their phones in their bedrooms are significantly happier than those who do. That's why I'm always smiling. Yeah? Yeah. Because I don't charge my phone in the bedroom. My wife does. See, yeah. that's why. That's another uh -oh. reason why, why she's always grumpy. Will you go home and tell her? Yep. Oh, yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need counseling. <laughs> then you'll be sleeping with your phone, right? That's, uh, <laughs> Catherine charges her phone in a closet. For me, she recommended locking it in a mini safe. I bought one and started storing my phone inside, which simultaneously reduced my nighttime usage and made me feel like I was guarding the queen's jewels. Mm. The biggest test came with a trial separation, Lance, uh -oh. a 48 hour long period during which I wasn't allowed to use my phone or any other digital device. How long? 24 hours? A 48 hour. 48 hours. 48 hour oh period. Goodness. I know. So he goes on to explain the success. Over the course of 30 days, my average daily phone time as measured by the iPhone's built-in screen time tracker has dwindled from about five hours at the start to just over an hour. I now pick up my phone only about 20 times a day, down from the more than 100 before. I still use my phone for email and texting, and I'm still using my laptop plenty, but I don't ditch it for social media. I often go hours without so much as peeking at my screen. In one of our conversations, I asked Catherine if she worried that I would relapse. She said it was possible, given the addictive properties of phones and the likelihood that they'll only keep getting more essential. But she said that as long as I remained aware of my relationship with my phone and continued to notice when and how I used it, I'd have gotten something valuable out of this. I still love the world and probably always will, but now the physical world excites me as well. The one that has room for boredom, for idle hands, and space for thinking. I no longer feel phantom buzzes in my pocket or have dreams about checking my Twitter replies. I look people in the eye and listen when they speak. I take the elevator. I ride the elevator empty-handed. And when I get sucked into my phone, I notice and self-correct. 
It's not full recovery, and I'll have to stay vigilant, but for the first time in a long time, I'm starting to feel like a human again. What do you think, Lance? I like it. Yeah? <clears throat> I know that I wish, and here I'm going sound, to sound old, I wish we were back in the days before cell phones. Yeah? When As long as we take <clears throat> away TV, too. I'm okay with that, because I grew up basically without TV. Uh-huh. I mean, like I said, I I prefer... I mean, there there are a lot of times when I will, on purpose, be out driving when the ball game's on, so I can listen to my ball games. <laughs> I mean, because you know I have the XM radio, but right. but also because my St. Louis Cardinals, even when I live in Missouri, or when I live here in, in Ohio, if I, if it's a late night, you know, if it's late at night after the sun goes down in the summer, uh-huh. I can turn on my radio and pick up the Cardinal game. So. Um, I enjoy. I'm okay with that. I don't need television. That's yep. fine. I, I'm, I'm good with all of that. I mean, I, I think, and, I, and the reason I think these two topics go together, because I think that's part of the problem with seeking attention and, you know, this feeling of perfectionism and being able to do whatever, because it's like, well, you have all this technology at your fingertips. How can you fail? You know, we have this expectation is how can I make a mistake? I've got all the answers in the world right here, you know, in this, in this device that is stronger than any computer that I went to college with. Yeah. Right. I mean, people's phones today. More, more advanced than when we landed a man on the moon mm-hmm, for the first time. You know, which is about when I went to college. Um, <laughs> not quite, but almost. Um, and it's just, it's, we feel this pressure now and we feel like we have to, I mean, I can't stand it when people text me. Or they call me and, well, you didn't answer. Okay, why? Well, because I texted you something and I didn't answer right then. Why does my life have to revolve around your life? Your needs. You know, that's, I mean, that's not the way I grew up. You know, and and, and the pace of life was was better, was easier. I shouldn't say better, was slower, was easier. I think it's better. Uh You know, and and people relaxed and they were friendlier and they had time for one another and they might sit and have a cup of coffee with one another or, you know, a soda or break bread together because they didn't have to pick up their phone 14 times while they were trying to have a conversation uh, in person with another human being. You know, there, there are things that we're missing and we're seeing that now, yeah. you know, commercials on, <laughs> for me, commercials on TV or whatever ads that show, you know, put down your phone, Yep, have some time, you know, um, and it's being mindful of it, I think is the big thing. I mean, that's what this article gets at. It's not that we have to give up technology. Okay. It's right. just that we have to, we have to understand th- this all came on the scene so fast and we have not evolved to be ready to handle what we've been given. Uh, as Lance highlighted, it is immense power that we don't even take time to think about at our fingertips. And it's not to say that we shouldn't have it. It's to say that we have to be very mindful of how easily it changes the way we function uh, because it does. And the research tells us it does. One of the things that Brett and I have done, and, it, and it, maybe if you're struggling with this, this is an easy place to start, okay? Okay. Make We've had a rule almost since we've been together that when we go out to eat, we do not look at our phones at the restaurant at all. doesn't matter if somebody's calling. It doesn't matter if a text comes in. Usually they're on airplane mode, so we can't even get notifications. That's the one my wife gets on me about. Yep. But I will take it if it's one of the girls, you know, one of my daughters or something. Uh-huh. She's like, wait a minute, this is our time. <laughs> you know, this is, I mean, she gets upset. That's yep. where, that's probably the only time she ever gets upset with me. About my phone use, yeah, is is when we're sitting down to eat. Yep, but that's an easy one to start with if you're out there and and you feel like you have a problem. The other thing is do what I've done, and if you, um, you know, there's a lot of different apps you can install on an Android device for screen time, and iPhone has a built-in feature. Just do that and put it there because you'll that will be one of the biggest deterrents you'll find is when you realize how much of your life you're giving. Uh, it, it is humbling and I knew mine would be less than the average. Um, but I was surprised to learn that I was spending about an hour and a half a day in front of my phone. Uh, the uptick has come though recently. Uh, it's been more time. And part of that I'm sure is, uh, contributed to the fact that I'm running for a political office and I, I 
am regularly communicating with people more via text and I'm checking social media more. I probably didn't go on Facebook but once a week um, previously and now it's, you know, not daily but probably every other day. Uh, so there's things like that that you just have to be conscious of too right. so that you don't let them turn into uh, a bigger problem. That makes sense. Yep. So things to think about. I know we shared a lot on that second article, but it was one of those where I think there was a lot of good – info there. So let us know your thoughts at TrueChatORG, Facebook, Twitter, and more. And Lance, for those new people tuning in, what are all the ways they can listen? Well, you know, you can just try, but but make sure that whatever your hour a day is includes our show and that you're using <laughs> yeah. your device well, see, but you to get on. <clears throat> you, you, only have, you only have to use your phone for probably 30 seconds or less ah, to listen because then, then you can the turn radio, it off. See? Right. And, and and while you're and you just listen when you're tuning us in, you can go to Spotify mm-hmm. or Stitcher or Apple Podcasts or anywhere else that fine podcasts are found. That's right. We're not asking for for more than a few seconds of your screen time because you can disengage with your phone while engaging with the world on the state of us. An even better reason to listen to us. That's right. See, you you can still stay in the know. All right, for the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, I'm Justin T. Weller and I'm Lance Jackson. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change.